This is the 21.5 Show. You're on 121.5, the emergency frequency. Whether you're a professional pilot or want to be one, you're in the right place. Let's get started. Join professional aviators Dylan and Max as they talk their experience in the airlines, business aviation, and more. Life is good. Industry experts, unique stories, and plenty of fun. This is the 21.5 Show. Here we go. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, we have done it. The broadcasters at the 21.5 podcast have made it 100 episodes. Congratulations, Max. Did you ever think we'd, we'd get this far? I didn't really think about it, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> but I am surprised it's 100. That seems like a lot of... It's a lot of content. Time and effort at this point. That's good. It's a lot. But I think we've accomplished things that are valuable to the community. 100%. I think we've... We've provided some education, a lot of entertainment, and possibly a few actionable steps. Some crappy advice, you know? Some, it's some good, though, really I mean, bad advice has been given by many members of this show. <laughs> fake it till you make it. You know, yeah. you said it best, though. <laughs> At least half of I mean, of when this. you're talking about a guy upgrading to captain that's yeah. nervous, he might not be ready. That was just gold. Yeah, just go you know? for it. Wow. Uh, welcome to the 21.5 show. Uh, my name is Dylan. I'm one of the hosts. A pilot in business aviation. I am, of course, as always, for the 100th time, joined by my co-host and friend, Maxwell. Yeah. We, we're going to take a little trip down memory lane today, Max. Um, you know, some of our, some of our early memories, uh, some of our favorite moments of the show, uh, we're going to play to, to, to catch Joel up to, to know wisely we he didn't hear a lot of the these things that happened way back because i don't think he would have signed up to join our, our merry party had he been aware of some of the things we we did over the air <laughs> back in the early days uh, and then uh as a special treat for folks we went live for the first time ever uh with our boy james o'neill and it was an over an hour of live flight flight advice helping folks out having some jokes um and so for the second half of the program, we're going to play that episode for you or that uh, that live recording for you so you can enjoy it back in, in real time. Uh, it was actually in video for the first time we made appearances on camera. We'll have the links to the LinkedIn and the YouTube broadcast, too, if you actually want to see our faces. Um, I was swimming with my kids in the pool a couple of weeks ago and hit my nose on the bottom of the pool, Max. How so do you I have even this do huge that? scab on my nose. I don't know. We were trying to swim really deep, yeah. So it was a perfect time for me to do a video swim recording. Really looks, yeah, it looks like I got into a bar were fight. You skin diving in your pool? Was there like yeah. shellfish down there? You're after? Like, what are you? Exactly. That's were you right. picking up a ring? One of your kids mm-hmm. threw in the deep yeah. end. Yeah, exactly. A glass ring. <laughs> wow, that's impressive. Yeah. Um, so, anyways, all right. Should we should we take a trip uh, down memory lane here? Yeah, I don't. I mean, these are the 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 early episodes were we were not. We were not very good. It was not polished. Do you remember? Do you have any? Do you recall? Tell while I'm pulling up this first clip, I want you to tell the listeners about where our recording setup for the first few episodes, what we did, where we were, and like how were we were doing that. Can you do that? Do you were remember? we in my in my office at mm-hmm. at the hangar I work at the you know our our hangar facility at my yep previous corporate flying position. Yep. Yeah, we had like a. Did we buy? We bought some stuff off of like Craigslist, right? Well, That's first weird, we had a, like, a YouTube microphone, or no, a, a USB microphone that we shared. We did? Yeah, we were sharing a microphone. So we had to like perfectly place it halfway in between. So dumb. Blue Yeti, <laughs> We were like up in my office in some folding table. Yeah. Was yeah. Then we bought something on Craigslist. <laughs> yeah, then we bought a setup. Remember, and then the guy wanted to lease it back from... We are like, what? <laughs> so could, could you guys meet me in a library and produce my show? Like, what no. was his show? Something hilarious remember. too, like his podcast. Was his podcast, really yeah. Weird. I don't remember what he wanted us to meet him in a library so he could do a show. That's the best thing. Would... So, what you guys have to understand about Dylan is anytime he buys something, somehow he ends up in this long term communication situation. <sighs> like, dude, he still, you still talk to the guy you bought your house from, and that guy was so weird. Like, I'm, I sold you the house. <laughs> yeah. The guy, remember? And he's like, oh, God, what? I wish you wouldn't have given those cabinets away. I would have, you know, and like, it's so weird, dude. And it's like, like having you, a pen and I remember you were texting with this guy for like a hundred dollars set of 
crappy podcast gear that we bought, and you were like dealing with him forever. You oh, just can't all the time. Yeah, you need to learn how to ghost gift. people. It's a gift. Anyways, <laughs> um, <laughs> you and Nippa is a real yeah. <laughs> I, I find new and interesting ways to. Uh... Southwest 101, delete the chipper speed oh. restriction, maintain 300 knots. Sorry, better to my bad. Up. We're gonna have to delete. What that is that? <laughs> yeah, I'm t- I'm trying to queue us up. I didn't think it was live. Who was it? Who was that though? That was Derek Vento. Because that. Oh was yeah, that's Vento. right. Oh, we need to have him back on. I like that guy. Remember it's we a, we, a we played some character. music and, and made him freestyle. Yeah, <laughs> that was awesome. Yeah. We could play that next time. Derek, I'm putting you on notice, bro. Prepare something. Because we're going to... Uh, okay. All right. You ready for clip number one, Max? This is an all-timer. This is a classic. Um, Joel, I think you're going to enjoy this. This was the origins of one of our favorite. I'm very excited. This is very exciting. Okay. Here we go. All right. I got something for you here. What do you think of that? Or this one? That's the Warren horn. <laughs> See, because I used to always say, I thought the word furlough sounded like something you should play on a flute. (laughs) And (laughs) so Roy and I, you know, our buddy Roy, who's been on the show, we would always talk about the furlough flute. (laughs) And then we were talking the other day and then I was like, what about the warn horn? Dylan will be playing furlough. Piece number two. (laughs) Piece number two, 800 pilot. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> um that's terrible to laugh about it but i guess what else no do? i it is it's it is a huge deal for so many people and that's what we wanted to oh, kind of start off with a ton of these american airlines sends yeah. out a letter warn letter to 2500 pilots yeah <laughs> delta 2500 united 2250 express jet just went Huge and just sent one to every single employee at the company. That's um, a triple warn. Yeah, that's terrible, really. So, as many of you <laughs> furlough flu. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's terrible. I know. Like we're playing these sound effects and and laughing and. It's a super serious topic. Do not be offended. Yeah. I am at risk of Many furlough. Many people were. Yeah, along with I, and that's the thing air. is everywhere you go and every message board you read, it's furlough, it's doom and gloom, and it's very one-sided that's just really put people in bad moods. So we just thought, hey, we'll have a little fun with it. It's something that's 100% out of our control, right? Like, yeah. I mean, there's no, literally just, nothing you can do. It's just a funny sounding word. And it, yeah. And you that sound like a flute solo. Yeah, so exactly. Go. So look, we're trying to help folks and and through this, but at the same time, just just having a little fun with it. So hopefully we didn't offend you. And if we did, you can get your money back. Sorry. Full Send refund. us an email though. Yeah. Let us know. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay, that was clip one. And I'm going to go to the next one. There's just <laughs> one more. I don't, know where, I don't know how your mind works sometimes. <laughs> it's unbelievable. Okay. This, it was, it's awesome. All right, here we go had a chance to listen to the one with Carl Valeri, who was an Alpa furlough rep. That was a few episodes ago. Go listen to that one. He really explains the... Yeah, exactly. He doesn't do a flute solo, but he does do a good job of explaining what the process is. Of what? Of uh, furlough. <laughs> and and uh, then, obviously, our latest episode with James O'Neill that we did, talking about how to network and how applying for jobs. <laughs> Are you doing okay? <laughs> I don't know why it's so funny. It's just, I mean, it's just a little woodwind. <laughs> All right. So it seems, it seems like you're still laughing. You know, it turns out that hasn't gotten any less funny. <laughs> it's, it's, oh, it's gotten better with age. That's, that's it's funny cool. because I, we, we were like, we even, as we're hitting the sound effect button, we're like, well, we hope we don't offend anybody. Well, we did. We I remember how many ask. emails. What feedback did you guys get at the moment? Did we get emails where people were pissed oh, off yeah. about it? Oh, yeah. Half the remember. people thought it was the most funny thing to your to your question, Joel. Yeah. Half the people thought it was hilarious, and then half the half the people were really offended. So it turns out when, like, all of your listeners are facing a possible layoff, like, maybe it's not a laughing matter. <laughs> I bet everyone thinks it's funny. Yeah. I, the percentages have really shifted, though. Yeah. 
So I want to know where you got the flute sound effect from. That's what I. His son play, His son played them on the recorder. No, that was <laughs> that was prior to Gavin's flute uh, recorder lessons. Um, we got them off of a uh, the website where we get all our licensed yeah. audio. What, what, and what so do you I think, Joel? We hired a flute soloist. To I was hoping. These. I was hoping. I knew a guy, and yeah, he was just recently 35. furloughed. We yeah. decided to really put up some personal cash to hire a dude to play the yeah. uh, flute solos. Well, we I think it was it was right when we first got the audio mixing board too, where we had the buttons where you could push to play the sound effects. So you can like hear the buttons actually getting pressed in the episode because Max is hitting him so hard. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. furlough flute. Well, listen, it's uh, it's been put up in the top shelf of the closet for right now. But it, last thing on this, Joel, did you know that a listener's wife? Drew a bunch of like furlough flute picture, oh like God, illustrations. The one course. hiding in the grass, like the yeah. furlough flute hiding in the grass, getting ready to pounce. That was the, that's the greatest thing of all. We need, yeah. to, oh my God, we need to get Amos, of that, listener that's Amos and his hilarious. wife. Uh, yeah, they it was pretty funny. Yeah, so uh, out shout out to them because well, that, don't that worry. was really good. The furlough flute could come back someday. No, but yeah, it will. don't worry. <laughs> uh, I mean. It's, it's a cycle. It's a cycle. It already has. On it, honestly, yeah, um, I was going to bring it up. Um, jet it, jet it, and yeah, not good, not good. Okay, I'm going to queue up the second clip. This was, this was. A, we went a little. Uh, I I went story time on this one. This was back when I had gone on a rant. There's an airport drill called Heber. Um, it's in Utah, and folks uh, that are in business aviation know it. Um, it, it, it's the where you can fly into Deer Valley a little bit closer than Salt Lake City. I don't like this airport. I'm on the record uh, many times saying how much I dislike this airport. And uh, anyways, I had like said I, don't, I hated flying into uncontrolled airports. And then like two times in a row, I had to fly into an uncontrolled airport, including Phoenix Sky Harbor, which the controllers had um, microwaved a breakfast burrito. And literally, someone left it in there too long, and there was smoke, and they had to evacuate the control tower while I was trying to land. Um, so I'm going to play that clip for you now, and then Max and I take it off the rails a little bit. We taxi in and, you know, make their calls and whatever, clear the active. Would we taxi in? And the Alaska Airlines guy that's holding, we're parked. And he comes on the radio as we're, like, Put chalking in the FBO, and he goes, "Hey Challenger, did you forget to cancel your IFR?" <laughs> I'm like, "No, we canceled in the air." He goes, "Oh, <laughs> <laughs> but thank you." So, are you considering landing now, sir? Or are yeah, you just going to continue to hold? You're just going to continue to hold <laughs> IFR. So, and it was just weird. I've never heard that. Ha- like, it's. I mean, I get like when all the business aviation airplanes are doing it to like help each other out at certain air. Like, have you ever heard that at like Hayden? Yeah, of course. Yeah, general, yeah. Where everyone Anyways, cancels or you blast off the oh, like, you don't yeah, have to take off five. Yeah, there. there's all sorts of stuff. This guy, I think, just I don't know. He was he turned into Overwatch, just orbiting the airport. Goes, yeah. just cont- Could you hear him? To the uh, hey, check, watch this. Yeah, this hey the- Challenger, <laughs> did you forget to cancel your? <laughs> He's the eye in the sky, just orb. That's why he held. He was gonna <laughs> he just. Must have been he was gonna take on two yeah. guy or something. <laughs> it's like I'll just control this airport. Yeah, I got to I the got days this. in the air force. I could see the the burrito smoke coming out of the tower. I'll just. I've got, got this. a burrito situation. <laughs> now, folks from the flight deck, uh, yeah. here a little uh, airport cancellation uh, closure down below. Uh, we're uh, going to be Phoenix a- has a little bit of a smoking burrito situation. We're monitoring from the air and to a tactical support role here for the next uh, forty-five minutes. I hope none of you are going to well, be the captain connecting. in the Air Force twenty years ago used to control traffic, so everything's under control. Just sit back, relax. If you Cocktails look, are on us. If you look down at the uh, white challenger texting into the FBO, he's forgotten to close his flight plan. We'll, we'll, we'll be handling this. Anybody uh, sees uh, him, tell him to go give us a call. 1-800-WX-BRIEFING. <laughs> so anyways, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. 2021's been a weird year in the air so far. <laughs> the eye in the sky. You guys are idiots. <laughs> yeah <laughs> whoever that was thank you Alaska. yeah so thank you Keep i mean no safe. seriously i appreciate it. you know what i'd much rather have somebody say hey did you forget to, like if i actually had forgotten to f- well yeah how many times does that happen hey uh can you see a hawker on the ground yeah, if they cancel, exactly. we can't let anybody yeah. in until he cancels no 
They're in the call. They, they, remember, I've seen, I've heard him call oh, the yeah. FBI. The FBI was like, "Hey, is there a Challenger eight uh, zero? Yeah, right. Uh, Julian Foxtrot. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay, that was a clip. And then afterwards, as an Easter egg, Joel, we thought it'd be a great idea to even go farther and freestyle after. All good. Yeah. Oh, I mean, this was that after not? the show ended, right? After the show ended, we went for like another, like embarrassingly, like five minutes somehow. <laughs> Challenger, can I get a wins and tighten up that formation, Airman? Can I can I get a breaking action report real quick, just for the other? Uh, five, sir, five. it's dry. Sir, it's, <laughs> cancel that flight plan to give me a breaking action and then <laughs> uh, overhead break, and you're good. I got this. Any plus or minus on final? <laughs> <laughs> we're suspending beverage service while we provide this Overwatch uh, tactical maneuver here, sir. We're getting a little not, not right now, not right now. <laughs> I'm getting on the A cards immediately. I'm saving lives, son. <laughs> How else can you land at an airport if there's no control tower? All right, Southwest, turn left heading 270 to send and maintain 5,000. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Alaska Airlines, a 342, new call sign. <laughs> Overlord. <laughs> <laughs> Serpent 6. <laughs> All right, America, do you follow the Southwest on final? <laughs> Sidestep it to t- <laughs> Keep it tight. Two six right, plan on the north route. Don't just get on the ground. <laughs> take the keg route into the. <laughs> uh, we're going to take you around through enemy territory back to Charlie 24. <laughs> There's no other way. <laughs> Familiar with the uh, steep tactical approach here. We're going <laughs> to. Threats at the. Uh... We've got some unidentified bogeys at, uh, north of the airport. <laughs> Looks like to be a high-wing single-engine aircraft. We'll keep you advised. Well, the nice thing is, too, I mean, they could give live wind reports with the smoke of the burritos coming out of the control. That's a window. That's a window. Caution for uh, mountain obscuration from the burrito smoke coming from the town. PFR is not recommended, but we're doing it. I can't can't believe that could totally go... uh, is there any way you could land without a control tower? Now, are you able to extend the landing gear without an actual landing clearance? <laughs> there won't be any light gun signals or anything like that. Oh, you guys are just going to have to inform each other of your position. Is that, have you heard of is such a thing? technology? My manager's in the aim right now trying to figure out well, the best is I didn't even know what frequency goes. Yeah, we were just talking about that. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. That's, do you, do you guys have any input on this? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> now, I'm going to give you a vector to the two-mile, 45-degree entry of the pattern. Does that sound familiar? Yeah. Is that something you, you can it's work a, with? There's a segmented circle on the south. <laughs> now, this said, do, do you want me to send you on the 45, or would you like to overfly the airport 500 feet above pattern altitude and observe the windsock? <laughs> no, it's that. What's the tetrahedron? What's the thing called? <laughs> the wind tetrahedron. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we're yeah. going to go ahead and crash fire rescue standing yeah, by. Standing just in by. Case. We, we have no clue. <laughs> we're the. Uh, <laughs> we're throwing our hands up in the air, which is classic. I, those now, guys. there's a guy in Alaska that has assumed something called Overwatch. We don't see that in the pilot controller glossary. Have you heard of <laughs> A report of a flare coming. <laughs> oh man. Okay. Uh, all right. That's a call quiz. That's good. That was That's awesome. Good. Yeah. So we didn't have anyone keeping us in check back then. So we just some we would just say it was better back then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> some would not. Some would not. I don't know. Let's see. Um, no, so that was good. fun. I had one. I have one more memory, Max, to to play the listeners from way back in the day. But I'll I'll say any any thoughts on that? Any uh, no, to reflect? Well, no? it's funny because that's oh that's similar to what we do normally. Like we just like being idiots and laughing and making fun of yeah. other people. So you know that's classic uh, Dylan and Max Joe. Right? How'd there. you come up with the Professional Pilots podcast name? What was that, what's the <laughs> Yeah, with that in mind. Yeah, exactly. That was, that was based on the we, listeners, not the uh, the host. Yeah. Um, okay, final clip here. This is a surprise. We didn't get. It wasn't all one hundred percent positive. Yeah, this we, is our we second had episode. One uh, sour grape in the bunch. It was one of our closest friends from college. You know, he's just. 
a bitter airline pilot. I guess he doesn't enjoy yeah. our show, but uh, we called him. We recorded it. So um, here's a little <laughs> clip of our conversation. I think we're going to start calling. We, we need a name for this segment. Yeah, I think uh, Straight Talk with Ted. Real Talk with Ted. Real Talk with Ted. Something like those. that. Yeah. He's, he's just right to the point. Yeah. As you'll okay. See. Here's our call. Calling you. We're in our recording studio right now. We just wanted to get your initial reactions on the podcast. A beer of, of one twenty one five. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I don't think if if I have to listen to you talk about aircraft corrosion for an hour, I would. would you know, I'd rather shoot myself. <laughs> <laughs> what, what do you want me? To, no. What do you want to hear me what talk about, about? European corrosion, no offense. <laughs> especially in the European market. <laughs> um. No, that was fine. I don't. I don't know. <laughs> That's a ring. It. Wow. Gonna, can, wow what, a, what a resounding. <laughs> can we use that for our website? Yeah. Do you actually use <laughs> yeah, that, that sound clip? That's fine. Anyone you can quote me. Maybe I think we need to go back to that Max, where we just we talked to Ted for like what was that forty seconds? <laughs> it's, it's Did fun. he just hang up on you right there? Or? Yeah, Eddie hung up. Yeah. <laughs> that was it. That's it. That was yeah. good. That was good. Yeah. No yeah. offense. Where it all? That's where it all started. <laughs> It was fine. It's where it all sense. Yeah. Yeah. 100 episodes in, Max still can't get close enough to the microphone for people to hear him. All right. Well, those were some of our favorite memories. Um, when we hit 200, we'll have some more uh, to share, I think. I mean, we didn't even get into a couple of the... When we made Derek Vento freestyle rap. That I was it. I like that yeah, one. We'll have to pull that one next time. That's, so. that's cool. We need to do that again. Yeah. We need to get Derek yeah. Vento back on. That guy is... Uh... Yeah. He's a lot, especially when you, what that listener said he plays his the playback at like one and a half speed. So, yeah, that was fun. <laughs> if if you have a favorite memory from the show, uh, shoot us an email info at twenty one five podcast dot com. We'd love to hear about it, and uh, and we'll share it in a future segment of the mailbag. Um, before we jump into the mailbag, though, uh, any industry news out there, Max? Yeah, I saw one that that has been a hot topic on this podcast that came across the uh, AIN newsletter. Uh, the FA. So, so remember the the email we got from the. I mean, it was recently, like the last couple episodes. With the guys like, do you guys think the FA will ever make cha- you know positive changes on on me- mental health reform? And right. we're like, yeah, I think they will, but it is going to be painfully slow. That that was our response. Remember? Well, this says FA easing aeromedical rules for mental health issues. The FA is revising its certification procedures and rules to make it easier for pilots grounded by mental health issues to regain their licenses and encourage those needing help to get it. Federal Air Surgeon Dr. Susan Northrup said yesterday at the Business Aviation Safety Summit in New Orleans, currently 30 to 40% of applications reviewed by the medical division have a mental health component. Northrop said, yet only between 0.1 and 0.2% are denied licenses or recertification for medical reasons. The FAA is eager to dispel the myths about the impact of mental health conditions on certifications so we can destroy the barriers to treatment, she said. Now, here, this is interesting. So, in 2010, the FAA approved four SSRI, which are antidepressant you know, medications, for pilot use. And pilots who report taking them have been doing remarkably well, she said. In December, the FAA ended the requirement for annual neurological follow-up tests, and the agency is now considering adding seven additional SSRIs to the approved list. North has said that for grounded pilots with applications on file, the agency is decreasing wait times, but admitted they are still unacceptable at this moment, particularly for pilots filing initial SSRI documents. The recent hiring of additional psychiatrists to review applications should help reduce the backlog she added so that's encouraging and also the fact that the uh, ssris have been around since 2000 or that have been approved since 2010 was uh frankly news to me yeah i think this definitely deserves a little bit more exploration i'd love to get our folks in from harvey watt on a future episode to do a little segment on this and yeah chat a little bit about it I mean, we've had multiple people we write in, and, yeah. and certainly the sentiment out there is that if you have mental health issues or even depression specifically, like you put it under your pillow and don't talk about it, which is certainly not the healthiest way to deal with those type of things. But everybody's uh, attempting to protect their medical, which one, 
may be unnecessary. If you can get an approved SSRI, talk to your AME and, and get that worked out. Um, and it sounds like the FAA is certainly moving in the right direction. And uh, I didn't anticipate seeing something like this so soon after that question, but uh, good news. So yeah, I think we should talk to somebody and, and maybe get into this because this has obviously been a, a, a important topic on this show. For yeah. Some time. And I wanted to give a shout out to uh, Maddie and Emma who uh, from the pilot's pandemic podcast they were on our show recently they uh have been tackling this issue for a long time and they have their own podcast called pilots pandemic they were on uh nbaa's podcast the last couple of uh episodes as well i'll have a link to that but um, they're really leading the charge so hats off to them for all their hard work um okay should we jump into the mailbag should we go head first Let's do it Head Please. first, of course, the mailbag is brought to you by our friends at Advanced Air Crew Academy, aircrewacademy.com, to check out all of the educational platforms they have available to professional pilots around the globe. If you've got a flight department and you need to keep your pilots up to date on the latest and greatest, go check out their offerings. It's easy. You can log in. It's more exciting than that other three-letter initial training system that many of the 135 pilots uh, know. Uh, they've got so much good stuff, newsletters, blogs. Their latest blog post just has a very mysterious title. I'm just going to tease the title. It says, NTSB moving faster than the speed of sound. Hmm. What do you think that's about? No, maybe it's new supersonic <laughs> legislation. I don't know. Could be. I'm going to oh, drop so. a link in the show notes to that blog post so you can go find out exactly how fast the NTSB is moving. Aircrewacademy.com. All right, Joel. What do we got? You want to start with some reviews and comments? Sure. Please. First one, the only 121.5 I can listen to for an extended period of time. Not like that other 121.5 with the constant meowing and fart noises <laughs> and Delta pilots raging. O'Day 26 <laughs> gives it five stars. I Woo. love that. That's the best, is that people screw around on 121.5, and then the, the, the guy that gets on that's like taking it serious to scold everybody... Like, how can you be so unaware that you're literally, there's like a campfire that you're annoyed with, and to put it out, you're literally going to pour five gallons of gas on it. That's what I feel like the metaphor is. Like, you, you think that the guy that, guy that meowed and farted on 21.5, and the guy that comes out, listen, everybody, let's, uh, let's keep some semblance of professionalism here. This is an emergency frequency. That is like... That's the funniest thing that comes on 21.5 is, is that guy. It's hilarious. There's always so, one. And, but they think they're like, re- listen, uh, son, you get, you get calm one. I need to take care of something over here. Yeah. I need to teach these youngsters about... Uh, yeah, it's, give me... This is probably the, the Alaska guy in Overwatch. Oh. <laughs> Stand by. Stand by one. I need I'll to uh, handle a situation here on the uh, 21.5. Listen, everybody... I have the guns. All right. <laughs> okay. During your guys' live show the other day, you asked them, hey, what hotel are we in? You'll get a prize. And so we had a listener guess correctly. They said, love the show, informative and interesting. This is the podcast for anything and everything aviation. Love the Roger Reeves episodes and anything with Diamond Dog. James O'Neill is always the best. Look forward to when I see a new episode and can't wait till you start producing three episodes a week. Yeah. Phil from LinkedIn. You'll be... You'll still be waiting for a while on that. Yeah, You're going to be waiting never. a long time, Phil. <laughs> Phil. I can tell you that will never happen. Three a month Thank would you. not really be possible, Phil. So. Shout out to also those Redditors out there. We had some uh, good Reddit discussion. <laughs> us. My favorite. Who's cruising the Reddit? Which one of you is on Reddit looking not at me. this stuff? I am. I am. <laughs> That's why it's a new... It's, a new, it's where my it's stone carving is all posted. Get a lot of upvotes. Stone carving. Okay. <laughs> all right. Next in the mailbag... Gentlemen, I am annoyed. Allow me to explain. A friend recently pointed me your direction, and after discussing the Roger Reeves episodes, I learned my former co-pilot is his next-door neighbor. I, too, survived meals from the PFM, avoided Avelina's walks from the old halls, and suffered from a specific Prescott-born vision malady, all in the same era as you. I was even Phoenix-based and qualified for food stamps while flying for great mistakes with a friend of mine. We then went on to fly for the regionals. I went to Express Jet, where my employee number started with a U. People told me it stood for, you better hope this works. It did not. <laughs> I was furloughed in 2008, like everyone else. 
I then went the corporate path and now fly a Falcon out of BFI, and I'm part of PNBAA, Pacific Northwest Business Aviation Association. My friend has gone on to fly a bus for a former David Nealman company. He started to make an educational aviation series while I was filming YouTube videos about a day in the life of a corporate pilot. I removed them and now only post Instagram. All this to say we have had very parallel lives, and with my friend being 121 and me being 91, 135, I am annoyed we did not start an aviation podcast. We both have an interest in producing aviation media, went about it in our own ways. Why the thought of joining forces doing something like 21.5 never occurred to us, I'll never know. Every time I listen to the quality podcast you produce, I'm annoyed that we did not start one ourselves and beat you to market. I'll continue to enjoy your podcast with an air of annoyance. Remember, flexibility is key to air power. With my annoyance, Nick. Well, that was just artfully crafted there, Nick, with all of the references and uh, everything else. <laughs> but you snooze, you lose, bro. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I don't know what else to say. <laughs> There's those that there are those that say it, there are those that do, Nick. That's right. <laughs> now That's he's right. really annoyed. Now he's like, God, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I checked out Nick's uh, Instagram. It's really good. And uh, listen, Nick, I think you should create some uh, content, and we'll be happy to uh, to uh, repost it. How about that? Wow, that's generous of you, Dylan. Yeah, yeah. Wouldn't that be great? <laughs> what a guy. You know, I mean, that's, his your generosity it just is. <laughs> it's, it's, Knows no limits. I mean, that's yeah. incredible. Thank you for There's that. There's just a little release form you have to sign, <laughs> releasing all of your rights. And uh, uh, It was funny because he, he referenced the, uh, the specific Prescott-Born vision malady. Uh, that, do you remember what that was funny. called? No. I had to dig deep for that one. It was brittle vision. Oh. <laughs> that's good, that's good great. See, like I very said, clever. these references run very I deep. Very deep. Yeah. Nick is just... Real. PFM. Well, Joel, in another episode, we'll tell you what the PFM stood for. A real we'll wordsmith, a real wizard yeah. of the uh, metaphors here. Hats off, Nick. Thank you for that. Next. Hi, guys. Well, it's that time again every two years, whether I like it or not. Time to refresh the CFI. And every online FERC is just awful. Page after page of reading, death by PowerPoint, with few pictures or videos to break up the monotony. Then quizzes after each section. Not to mention the timer that forces you to stay in a section until the FAA thinks you've been there long enough to read it all. Most pilots I talk to do American Flyers or ACFI because you pay once and you can use the FERC for life. I don't care about cost this time. I want a FERC that is interesting and engaging and isn't just all reading. Can you ask your listeners to recommend the best FERC, online or in person, that doesn't make me want to gouge my eyes out? Thanks, Mike. Right. Well, I, yeah. Anybody write in, uh, a call is out for the best FERC. But I'll tell you what, Mike, as painful as it is, continue to renew your CFI. Take it from me. You don't want to be trying to figure out how to renew your CFI in your 40s. Okay? That's that's where Take I'm it at. from both because, of us. Yeah, because I blew it. and and We it's, both did. It's so stupid. And then you, you want it back, and it's like you got to find a DPE, and, go, and, and then it can't do it, and it's just... The whole thing is it going to involve five thousand dollars in the lab? <laughs> <laughs> Listen, <laughs> I've uh, I and I blundered this so many times. I flew with a dude whose dad was a uh, examiner up in in Ohio and he had a plane. We were flying, he's like, Oh, you want me to renew your CFI real quick? And I, he was just going to charge me like, like very little. And I was, I don't know why, and I didn't take the opportunity there, which was so stupid. Like, I had the plane available, the whole thing, and I'm just idiot. I had, yeah, some FAA guys would do it on their line checks for 135. Somehow I never got up someone that would I do know. it. Or you used to be able to get it renewed like it in 121 too. Like when you, there's so many. So many mistakes. Idiot. So listen, even if the FERC is painful, even if you don't find a fun and good one, stick with it. Just think about having to figure out how to, uh, you know, teach slow flight in, after you haven't for 20 years to get it back. So yeah. That's, what's worse? brutal uh and the last my last point there yes our listeners should write in and and uh and and say what what's best but i know who pet does the best uh, job of producing online educational content it's air crew academy send an info to, email to them and be like why don't you guys make an awesome FERC? that's what i that's think a really good idea why don't you send yeah. an email to dan info at, uh, I mean, he's I the owner of the company you have a personal relationship dylan maybe that would yeah. be more effective yeah dan all right check your inbox <laughs> yeah, dan Let's make a cool FERC. <laughs> go on dan let's go all right, what's next? 
Gentlemen, let me start off by saying what a great podcast. It's fresh, relevant, and entertaining, although I do have mixed feelings about the two-part Roger Reeves series. I just finished it listening to episode 99 and have to say I was disappointed in your aviation volunteer advice. May I offer up a few more suggestions? Oh, please do. So he goes on. Please do. Gives really good summary, but in summary, that's Angel Flight, AOPA, Airport Support Network Volunteer, Aviation Museums, Civil Air Patrol, Experimental Aircraft Association, and their Young Eagles program. And that's just to name a few, he says. And this was all volunteer work that you can do if you don't own an airplane to volunteer that. That's just showing up having aviation knowledge of being a pilot and volunteering. So uh, he was correct. We missed a lot of them. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I also wanted to tell you that the advice you gave about living your life to max fulfillment hit home. I'm approaching 30 years at my day job and want to spread my wings at a 121 or 135 operation before I find that I can't fly no more. I look forward to more of your great insight and advice. Go Buckeyes! Splinter. <laughs> yes. Yes. Ugh. Get out of here. Half of these I think you write, Joel. <laughs> Wouldn't that be funny uh, if you no. had, like, Joel confess in a couple years? <laughs> uh. On the 200th we're, we're, episode, we're, we're really guys. getting any reviews or anything. So I just yeah. <laughs> you guys told me to up. do all the reviews in the mail, but there nothing was there. I knew it. You know how many emails I have now. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I could only make one out of five a Buckeye fan. He, Joel's just taking our aviation license plates and then putting those at <laughs> gmail.com and creating all these emails. <laughs> Seven thirty-seven captain yeah. at gmail.com. Oh, look at that. <laughs> He, see, that was the dumb thing in our contract with him. We we like said we were going to pay him by the email and review. So yeah, <laughs> big mistake yeah. on our part. Only positive ones. See, you notice how we never nobody ever uh, writes in and says we suck. Right. That's weird. Well, no, these we got two emails that said that. No, Splitter, well, we that, that was a really good email because they were pissed off about the Roger Reeves situation. Yeah. So no, I, I did. I'll tell you, I was on, honestly when we did that volunteer email, we I I was walked away from that. I'm like, ah, we did not do a good job there. So thank you for calling it out, Splinter, and sending it in. And that's one of the reasons that we love doing the mailbag is because often people call us out or have great suggestions for us. So we always Listen, appreciate when people write in. We're not the smartest people in the business. That's right. We just have a, a forum for people to. Yeah. The, the best will rise to the top, so we appreciate it. Thank you, Splinter. Um, if you want to tell us that we suck or uh, give better <laughs> advice than we did, you can do that easily by uh, sending us an email, info at 215podcast.com. You can always visit the website and send us uh, an anonymous message as well, and that's on the flight advice link on the main page. I think that's it. Speaking of flight advice, Max, we did a lot with James last week live. Yeah. Um, thanks to the magic of producer Joel getting all of the uh, video and, and uh, the, the, the what, are the, what do you call it? Digital assets? We had an incredible, incredible show. A lot it of professional cool. production uh, value in there. A lot of production and a lot of participation. So I want to thank any of the listeners that tuned in live. Uh, it was really cool because we, we read some flight advice that we had that folks had emailed in. And then the comments just started coming in with a bunch of questions from people. So we loved helping folks out. Um, so we're going to play that. It's just over an hour long of a uh, live flight yeah. advice, but here it yeah. was like a true yeah, live yeah. show because most of the stuff we talked about were people that were interacting yeah. live. So people don't think yeah. like we, we like, you know, spoof the whole thing. Like those were actual people that wrote in and then Joel somehow through his wizardry posted them up on the thing. Yeah. It was pretty incredible. Um, so, uh, if you want to listen to it audio, it's great and it, and it and it stands by itself. But it's even better if you want to jump in on the video. We'll have the uh, links for uh, LinkedIn and U YouTube in the show notes if you want to watch this. Do you part. listen to any podcast on video? Do you watch podcasts ever? Here's a weird one. I don't know how to explain this. I always watch Lex Fridman on video. It's so much harder to watch it on video though because you like you can't just listen to it while doing other things or whatever. It's so much more. Like I'm watching one right now, and of course it's like four hours, but you have to yeah. watch it because the guy being interviewed is drawing diagrams, and there's a lot uh -oh. of visual interaction. But dude, it's taking me two years to. It's amazing how long it takes to, because uh, you can't multitask. Like you, yeah, have to sit there and well, watch it. Like you can't, you know. For whatever reason, I was paying for YouTube Premium for a while where you can because you can you don't have if you don't want the screen. But the whole on, point, you know how? Yeah, I know. It, well, it just I, I can't explain it. That's why I canceled it. But I was doing that for a while too. So what's with so. you and Lex Fridman? Like he like I don't know. The I funny just, thing I is, just love he's looking like, at Lex. He's pretty like he's talking. 
he's pretty monotone and non-animated. Like, why, why would you choose that one to watch? It's unexplainable. I don't know. I, I just, for whatever, here's why is because it's like when I'm doing stuff around the house, and YouTube's on or whatever, and it pops up, and he's there, and I'm like, oh, yeah, what's the latest Lex? And then I just put it on while I'm doing other things. That's the weirdest thing, though, because if you subscribe to the... I don't know. Sometimes I, I don't uh, understand listen, you. I don't know. I don't know what to tell you. First you marry my sister, now this. <laughs> it's just, it's just <laughs> one mystery after another. <laughs> oh! Maybe... Haven't figured it out yet. Maybe in the next 100 episodes, we'll get to the bottom of my... Uh, what all goes my on weirdness. That's right. Uh, so... Uh, Here's the last thing before we jump into the live segment. Let us know what you think. Is this something you'd want us to do quarterly? I mean, I, I'd hate to have to talk to James that much, but we would do it. Not just with We'd James. We could have other people yeah. on that For I sure. make fun of live. Would you ever have Ted on live? Oh. <laughs> Whoa. Hmm. That would be. Oh, we would. We could do that. It would just. It wouldn't be as professional. You would have to like do a have lot of be like like... on the fly censoring. It really would be a personal no. challenge to you, Joel. Yeah, Joel. <laughs> you'd have your work cut out for you. No, we we could put don't they don't when you do live with somebody like that? Don't they do like a, a five second delay or something to give the producer time to like? Right. Yeah. How do they do that yeah. at CBS Sports? Yeah. How do the pros do it? Yeah. Get get Jim Nance on the phone. We'll that get, would we'll be find ten, out. Though, five seconds might not be ten. Ten. Yeah. I want to jump in. Yeah. Pre-recorded. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> So let us know. Uh, should we do more of these live shows? And who would you want on the next one? Uh, we'd love to hear it. We've Now that uh, Joel's got the technology figured out, we're, we're excited to go live. And I won't have a huge scab on my nose next time, hopefully. Idiot. <laughs> Here we go. All right, let's go. Uh, let's jump right in. We'll do it live. No. We'll do it live! We are doing it live. Welcome to our first live broadcast. Inspired by Bill O'Reilly, if you have not seen that clip from Inside <laughs> Edition. Every time I hear that, I cannot stop laughing. I've heard that for 10 years at least now. Oh, my goodness. Uh, that is the way to kick it off. Welcome to our first show. Of course, my name is Dylan. I'm one of your hosts, joined by Max down below and our friend and fellow Diamond Dog, James O'Neill. Welcome back, James. We have a ton of flight advice to get to tonight. But, of course, I wanted to start out by saying... You guys are on the road, right? You're joining us from hotels. I know we've got pilots, professional pilots in the audience today, and I'm curious if anyone is sharp enough to identify what type of hotel, hotel chain. Mark. Yeah. What type of hotel no, no, chain this is, is my living room? Yeah. I put yeah. a big oh, piece of marble up on yeah. the wall. I don't know if yeah. you noticed, but isn't it? So it, drop a comment in there uh, if you have an idea where Max is, what hotel chain Max is in, and where James is at. And if you get it right, We'll send you some swag. So nobody's going to guess where I'm at. Yeah. Uh, uh, we'll see. We'll see. It's, it's All right. fancy and off brand. <laughs> Boutique hotels only for James. He, he yeah. Find us. <laughs> All right, uh, folks, we are going to be answering your questions live. Of course, some folks already submitted some questions, so we're going to get into a couple of those now. We'll give you a chance to submit your questions for James. Uh, and Max, and I'm just going to kind of play the host of moderator today. Everyone knows my advice is, is pretty weak. So uh, let's get right into it with the first question and go ahead and drop those comments in and we'll get to those in a little bit. All right. Producer Joel is running the show and uh, let's go. OK, number one, this is a classic question we are getting so often. Hey, guys, current military pilot getting ready to retire in the next couple of years. Currently thinking about Delta United, NetJets or corporate. Flying wide body aircraft intrigues me. What are some of the non obvious questions I should be asking to help me figure out where to go? James, I imagine you're getting this question pretty often. We are. And the, the interesting thing about it is when people say wide body aircraft intrigues me, typically the first thing that I, that I ask is, is it actually flying a triple seven or a seven four, which unfortunately all the guys missed all the fun conversations about seven four flying before we, uh, we hopped on. But is it the actual flying the wide body or is it the actual type of flying of flying the long haul international? So if you think about it, right, um, let's say you're um, you're flying for a legacy airline. Actually, now folks are doing non-legacy airlines into Western Europe. But, you know, let's say you're talking about a trip into Western Europe. Are you interested in taking off at, let's call it 5 p.m. on a Monday getting there about seven to nine hours later, hanging out for about 36 hours and then coming back? Or are you looking to get in front of the global 
or a Gulf Stream flying over there and then hanging out and fishing or doing whatever you're doing for three or four or five days. Um, even up to, uh, you know, we have clients on certain corporate operators where the family basically plans a trip to Europe every year for one or two months. And they basically take the pilots, take their families with them. Right. So when we talk about, yeah, I mean, it's, it's pretty cool. And a lot of folks don't think about that, but you know, we talk about that wide body flying. Is it, is it, Hey, look, I'm looking to go to London and go to, you know, be there for 36 hours and get to do one thing and then come back or, Hey, I want to go to Tokyo. And like I said, you're going to get, you know, to do maybe one or two of the same things all the time and then come back. Or are you looking at that more the international lifestyle where you get an opportunity to kind of experience certain things while you're over there for a period of time? So that's the first thing I ask when it comes in into wide body flying. Uh, the second part of it is really taking a look at what do you what do you want your lifestyle to look like? Is the wide body about the prestige and the, hey, look, I've done it and kind of the status aspect of it? And by the way, that's not a bad thing. I'm not saying that like it's a bad thing. Um, but the reason why I bring that up is because honestly, a lot of folks need to ask themselves, you're 65 years old, you're looking in the mirror and you're looking back at your career and your life. Are you going to feel sadness or resentment when you look back and go, man, I never flew a 7.4. I never flew a 777 or a 787, right? If that's the case, you kind of got to go do it. You don't necessarily have to do it permanently, but you're probably going to have to, you know, it's one of those things where it's like, hey, I got to check the box off, right? To say I did it, kind of have that sense of accomplishment. So if it's status driven, then it's it's really hard to, to kind of get that fixed without actually doing it. But if it's lifestyle driven, then it becomes a little bit more of a complex conversation where we start taking a look at, um, you know, especially when you take a look at like a NetJets, where the, I mean, those guys have a for for international pilots, they got a really good quality of life, right? You take a look at certain Part 91 flight departments where you get a really good quality of life. Um, then kind of that formula starts to change a bit. So that's kind of the first thing that I that I talk to people about sitting down and and thinking about is why do you want to do that? Is it lifestyle driven? Is it hey look box checking driven? But what's driving that? Because then that's going to lead you into whether or not corporate or airlines are the way to go on there. And I think another important consideration with that too is is you talked about that hypothetical scenario where you fly you know to Western Europe for nine hours, hang out for thirty six hours. But what if you had to commute in six hours before that and hang out in the crew room before that nine hour flight? And so if you live somewhere where none of the airlines you listed have a pilot domicile for wide bodies at that, or uh, you know then maybe NetJets or something in a domicile city where you eliminate commuting from the equation. Cause I can't, and, and I think some of the military pilots too, um, don't have as good of an understanding of, of the lifestyle hit that commuting takes, um, versus maybe people that came up through the reg regionals and have seen and had people sit on their jump seats that, that commuted. So, so, you know, I think that is definitely a huge consideration is, uh, anything you can do to be able to drive to work is going to enhance your lifestyle substantially. So the other thing that that folks don't kind of think about when it comes to the airline side of the house, and this kind of depends on whether or not you have kids or not, but like, I mean, I was kind of a nerdy kid growing up. I know that shocks you guys. You don't say, James, huh? <laughs> I know. Wow. I but, didn't see uh, that one coming. I, I remember like when I was really young, there were a couple of family vacations where like I happened to be learning something in school. And so that's where my parents plan on us to go to vacation, right? So you think about you're a wide body international pilot. And as your kid's going through school and as your kid's learning things, you can actually take your kid on the flight, bring them over to that country, show them some cultural things, some history things, whatever that is, right? There are experiences that you can weave into that that you're only going to get in an airline that you're not going to get anyplace else. So really understanding the why behind you want to do that matters. Well, and I think Chris here in the comments really sums it up by saying, uh, we have unfilled narrow body captain vacancies at United because right seat wide body flying is like crack. <laughs> Dozing for dollars, yep. I know they call it. Some airlines, <laughs> yeah. Right? Uh, he also he also had a good point. You better be able to sleep on a jet if you're going to yeah. do that, right? Uh, I know one of my friends. You're food movie critic. I mean, yeah, exactly. <laughs> my my you are. Buddy, That's what you're doing. 
That's I had a buddy at United that was doing it on the 787, and he said, because I guess the, the relief officer is re responsible for the walk around. And yeah. so the big debate. And getting the blankets and pillows. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so the big debate was whether you needed to put your uniform on to do the walk around or if you could do it in your pajamas because you're going right to the bunk. So that, yeah. that comes into call, you know, the professionalism that we have in yeah. this industry. So, These are the uh, tough decisions you got to make as yeah. a wide body international pilot. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so, so I don't know. Did we answer anything for, for this uh, military pilot? I, I think really it comes down to there's a it's, lot. It starts unpack, with right? the why. It it really yeah. starts with the why. And and the big thing that folks are having trouble with right now is honestly staring in the face at five hundred thousand dollars a year and saying, "Hey, I'm not going to go do that." There, the 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 appeal of the lifestyle of corporate is what gets people thinking about that direction. But then the reality of, yeah, but my buddy next door is making four or $500,000 a year and I'm making half of that. That That's where the rub comes in. And, you know, so you got to kind of ask yourself, what is the dollar amount that I'm willing to place on my quality of life? And it turns out you can actually kind of calculate that. Um, but it can, it can be tough to give up $250,000, $300,000 a year to have a good quality of life for some people. Well said. Um, all right. Anything else on this one, Max? No. What's next? Let's see. We are. I feel Bill O'Reilly coming on. Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> Quickly. We could see. Where is the teleprompter? Whatever it is, it's not right on a teleprompter. I don't know what that is. I've never <laughs> seen that. <laughs> okay. This is another interesting one uh, we got. It says, my partner and I, both military pilots, are planning to transition into civilian flying. We're considering two options, both join major carriers for stability, or my partner joins a major carrier while I pursue a corporate aviation career. We're seeking insights on scheduling considerations, especially with regards to stability when children are involved, as I value a stable schedule, but find the Pirate 91 job exciting. Cool. So let's talk about, uh, so first of all, uh, okay, so... I would highly recommend you don't both work for the same company because um, I, you know, when everything's going great, it's great. But man, if anything goes wrong, right, you're both you're both in, in a really bad situation at the same time. So 2010, NetJets decides they're going to go through and they're going to start laying folks off. They actually laid office employees off before they laid off the pilots. Um, and they actually did it on September 11th, 2009. Um, and Eileen was working there at the time. And narrowly, I mean, like super narrowly made it through and didn't get laid off. A month later, I got my layoff notice. So if you're both working at the same carrier at the exact same time, if something goes bad at that carrier financially, you can end up going from making a million dollars a year to zero dollars a year pretty quick. Right. So first thing is, you know, give some serious consideration to flying for different carriers now. There are some some downside or there's sort of obviously some benefits to flying for the same carrier in terms of being able to fly together and so on and so forth. Um, but you, you really got to weigh that out, depending on if you have pensions and what are your savings and so on and so forth going into it. So that that's the first part of it. The second part of it is. One of you is probably going to have to choose a job based on flexibility. Yeah so that they can meet the schedule of the other. So I, I, we happen to have, I happen to have some friends where both spouses are pilots, right? And there is a give and take in that, right? There are different career goals that, that they swap out for each other in terms of not upgrading or not taking a certain position because it's gonna keep them separate longer. Um, so when you take a look at, and we can use Southwest as an example where you have super flexibility on scheduling that you're not necessarily going to get in the same way or to the same level at, let's say, United Delta or American. So making sure you're clear on, okay, regardless of what we choose, whether one chooses corporate, one chooses airlines, we both choose the airline, but we choose separate airlines or we both choose airlines and we choose the same airline. Where is that give and take going to be so that we can maintain the lifestyle that we want? Otherwise, you're both bidding opposite schedules. So somebody's with kids all the time while the other one's out on the road flying and you're basically not really living a life together, if that makes sense. Yeah, it's, it, it's going to be tough any way you cut it. We had uh, some people that we knew that worked at NetJets, and they just bid the opposite schedule. And it was, uh, for a while, it was a high five, you know, coming yeah. through the door. All yeah, right, see you in a week. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and that was like, 
obviously a very difficult and non-sustainable way to have a family. So, uh, yeah, to James token, find something with the maximum amount of flexibility and, and not in the same, at least, at least, I mean, one. maybe and even I- the sa- different segments too. I mean, you know, being corporate and airlines or even in a cargo carrier or something like that, just to diversify, I think would, cause yeah. well, the- as good as things are, they, they're not always as good. And the, the difficulty is, you know, imagine you both work for a part 91 flight department, right? That you're on call 24, seven, three, or, you know, 135, 91, doesn't matter, but you're on call 24, seven, 365, and you don't, you're scheduled more than 12 hours in advance, right? That's a really tough way to live a lifestyle. Um, imagine if you're both at legacy carriers, sitting reserved, commuting to outside bases, that's a really tough way to live a lifestyle. So there, there are factors that go into that in terms of really understanding what do we want our life to look like that will help steer down a, a very clear path. I was talking to a guy earlier today who flies a King Air, uh, part 91 aircraft owner. And I think last year he flew 98 hours and was gone 15 days for the entire year. He overnighted 15 days, right? You know, so you think about a job like that, like, man, that's a really great corporate job. Right. Super stable, no scheduling way in advance, not gone very much. Right. But he's not going to make three hundred thousand dollars a year doing that. He's going to sit in that one twenty to one eighty range pretty consistently. Yeah. But one of the trade offs I made when I went from being a part ninety one corporate pilot to an airline pilot is you may not fly as much and maybe you don't spend as many days away. But when the jet needs to fly, you got to be there to fly it where at the airlines you have you know, the numbers where you have options, you can trade, you can trade with the company, you can trade with other pilots, you can drop it. You can, you know, there's a lot, you have a lot more options if you need to be home. And, and as Dylan can tell you too, as a part 91 corporate pilot, even if you don't fly that much, the only way to guarantee you're going to fly is to plan something. I have your kid's birthday or whatever. And then all of a sudden, Oh, everything's falling into place. This is all going to work out. And then boom, boom. it just, I, I don't know if it feels like that or it, actually always happens but that's sure how it felt it's just because everybody always wants to do things at the same time that's what i found you know uh, one other thing i wanted to Before throw you. in there um is when they talk about scheduling certainty in that scenario the fractionals when you get that seven on seven off you know that for it's the most fractionals seven on seven off schedule at a fractional is the most predictable schedule you will ever have yeah um and it, I, I was talking to another guy last night, an NetJets pilot, about it. And he goes, look, the hardest thing to give up is that seven on, seven off. He goes, I know I can plan everything with my kids. I can plan everything with my wife. I can, they, you can plan everything and you can look a year out. People forget with the airlines, yeah, you have a schedule, but you're getting it basically by the 20th of the month before and it's changing every month. Yes, as you gain seniority, that schedule becomes more predictable, so on and so forth. But depending on the, the aircraft that you choose, the base that you have, the company that you go to, that could be months, it could be years. Um, and so really having a firm grasp on what commitment do we need from each other for availability and time is really going to drive that decision. And you're probably going to sacrifice certain career goals to make it work. Yeah, 100%. I can't guarantee that, but I would be prepared to have the conversation of who wants to sacrifice what. That's a good point. All right. Well, we got a ton of comments to get to. So uh, let's jump in. Uh, Philip White is the first winner for some swag. Um, he identified Max in the Marriott right away. <laughs> Boom. Very good quickly. work, Philip. Absolutely. There was no doubt. Uh, Philip, send us uh, an, an email info at 215podcast.com and uh, give us your address and we'll, we'll, we'll send you something. Also, your wife wrote in, James. Um, well, she, she made the book. And she cheated. <laughs> Genius. She wow. cheated. So you send us some Raven swag, Eileen. <laughs> uh, also want to shout out um, Timothy P. Pope in the audience. An- another Diamond Dog. Um, he he shared some of the bad advice that I usually give people, which is uh, fake it until you make it. Thank you for reminding me of that uh, painful memory, Tim. Appreciate that. Thank you so much. A um, couple other comments. Um, one came in from Jason and he's got a question for us. He says, I'm a mid 40 student pilot going for my ATP and is wondering what the process is when at the majors to upgrade from narrow body FO to wide body FO, or is it possible to go from regional FO to wide body FO? Yeah. So look, it's everything seniority based, right? And depending on what's going on at the carrier, you might have the opportunity to bid wide body FO straight out of initial training. 
Um, we've certainly, uh, you know, at both just in the past week, both Delta and United folks taking a look at, at what do they want to do the wide body versus the narrow body straight as an FO after they get there. There's some different variables that go into that calculation. Um, a lot of folks don't necessarily consider the fact that you may be able to bid the wide body, but if that company does not have a lot of experience putting new hires in that in that wide body aircraft, the training's probably not designed for you. Right. So, you know, when you take a look at a 737 or an A320 or a 717 or some of the 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 um, single aisle domestic airplanes, right, where they're historically they've been putting more junior pilots into for the past, I don't know, 100 years. Right. They've got training departments that are structured for that. Having someone go to a legacy carrier and go straight into a wide body is a relatively new thing, right? So the training programs that they have have been designed for people that have been at that company for five years or 10 years. There's certain assumptions they make about, do you understand certain company policies and procedures and how Boeing system works or Airbus system works or so on and so forth. So the first is when you get that opportunity right off the bat, you really want to ask yourself, hey, am, am I ready for that? And is the training program structured for the way that I learn? I say that because we've we've certainly had folks who have put in the hard work to get a job at a carrier, pick a wide body and not make through training. Um, tra and and care, a lot of the carriers are very honest about it. Look, the program's not necessarily designed for you. The other thing is, okay, yeah, you can bid wide body or you can get wide body FO right out of training. But if if all of a sudden people are constantly coming in, because remember, it's seniority based. So just yeah, because you got the airplane this month and somebody else yeah. got it six months from now, if their seniority number senior to you, guess what? You never move. You just keep going down the That's list. That's what uh, yeah. audience member Chris just said. He said you could go yeah. They're put United people are putting people on the triple seven and seven eight right now, but you'll be on reserve for forever. Yeah, yeah that's the thing. The, the one thing that hasn't changed even this market is that the, the wide body FOs as a whole are more senior than the narrow body FOs. That's not going to yep. change right away. And so, and it's the same as upgrading uh, to captain in a year at a lot of these carriers. It's yeah, you can, but you well, will be very but, junior for a very long time. But think, think about, so you go straight into the wide body, right? Let's say, let's say you're one of those folks that's really fortunate, right? Timing works out exactly correct. As soon as you get restricted ATP minimums, you go straight to a regional airline, right? So between 750 and 1,000 hours, you go to a regional, right? You fly exactly 1,000 hours at a regional and boom, you get hired into a legacy carrier, right? So now you basically have somewhere between 1,800 and 2,000 hours total time, right? Um, you may have some total have been in the industry flying professionally for three to five years, Right. And now you bid, you're like, oh, I'm going to go right to the triple, right? I'm going to go to A330. Okay, great. And now you end up being the international relief officer. So you never get to touch that flight controls. So now you're doing the pre-flights and getting the pillows, right? But you're not getting that repetition. You're not getting the time in the seat. You're, you're not getting the reps, right, of, of takeoffs and landings and just experience in the airplane. You're sitting there watching and you keep losing relative seniority in the fleet type as people keep coming in over you. And, and it can create a situation where you kind of robbed yourself of the opportunity to develop some, some judgment skills, decision-making skills, problem solving, so on and so forth, because you're just in an airplane that you're not really doing a ton on other than watching in crews. You guys are real downers, you know? Here's another way to look at this. Say you're like, this didn't used to be an option as a 25 year old or 26 year old. So if you do do that and, and you go to a junior base, oftentimes New York, right. Is always a junior wide body base and you get your studio apartment in, in the, uh, in the city and you can have a pretty good setup too, with a lot of days off and you could be right in the, in the mix and tell everyone you're a triple seven FO. Could work the, in your favor. The the other thing to think about with that though is if you want to take an immediate upgrade, right? So let's say you get hired by a carrier and you're going, look, I want to take the first available upgrade. Bidding the airplane that you think you can upgrade on gives you that experience. 
it gives you that experience and right. watching other captains do it. So you don't bid the triple or the A330, and then all of a sudden a year later you're going through an A320 course as a captain. So now you're a captain on a brand new airplane, and maybe you've never been a captain before. The first time some of these people are going to be captains is going to be at a legacy carrier. So yeah. there's there's certain variables that go into thinking through, hey, look, what do I want my career to look like? If if you're saying, hey, look, I want to sit on wide body for three to five years, yeah, fine, go straight in as an FO on a wide body. Um, but you just got to kind of think through, Hey, look, what do I want my, what do I want my next one or two steps to be? So you can put yourself in a position to be successful at that. Yeah. All right. Uh, another uh, question from the audience, this one from jab he says, uh, he or she says, can you speak specifically about the schedule flexibility at Southwest versus United that James mentioned? Um, there might be some people that know something about that. Uh, I, on can, the panel. I can uh, speak uh, very yeah, say, confidently about be... half of that, but the other <laughs> yeah. half I don't really know. So go ahead, James. You take it and I'll chime in. Well, so we're talking about the difference between uh, – so there's a couple of different things overarching that go into the difference in the flexibility. Uh, so the first is how do the reserve rules work? Right. Do you have to be within a certain distance of the airport? Don't have to be within it. You know, is there a two hour call out, 18 hour call out? Do you have what's called short call reserve, which is basically you need to be there. Let's just use two hours as, as a number versus long call reserve. Hey, you have 12 hours, 16 hours, 18 hours to get to the airport. Um, the second thing is, can you um, pick up trips in different bases? Right. Can you sit reserve in different bases or you have to sit reserve only in the base that you're in? Um, and then what is the ability to pick up and drop trips? And that's really where I would, from my perspective, the magic at Southwest is the ability to pick things up and, and, and as that one person says, pick them up, and put them down. Right. Um, it's the ability to pick things up and, and, and then drop them or, or trade them. Um, and so Max, if you want to kind of talk about the specifics, kind of how that works at Southwest, I think that'll kind of help them understand hey look how what is a, a max flexibility schedule look like well the first thing you have to realize is we you know it's an airline of over ten thousand pilots that all fly the same airplane so that in and itself gives you a lot more flexibility it's all the same airplanes at all the bases and you can fly any of those airplanes at any base so so that starting there you know you're a big leg up but essentially what you have the ability to do is it's not so much on reserve because the real flexibility happens when you can hold a line, but you can trade with trips that are constantly coming available through that the company has, there's other pilots can post trips. And so if you, you know, we call, I call it playing the game where it's not, you can't just be like, nah, you know, I don't feel like going to work tomorrow. I'll just trade this for Friday. It doesn't really work like that. But if you have some sort of strategy and ability and there's there's text alerts that you can sign up for. So when a trip that does meet your criteria shows up, you can, you know, be Johnny on the spot and log in and trade it and things. And and but at the end of the day, I haven't flown. I, I don't fly 90 percent of the trips that I am awarded in the bid because I move them all around to stuff that's better or. Cause I, and, and I'm not that senior and I only want to work on Wednesday morning, Thursday and get done Friday afternoon. And I'm almost 100% successful at doing that. And that's because of the ability to move all stuff around. And then, uh, to make yourself doubly successful, I've trained my wife on how to do this too. So she gets the, the same text alerts and she can jump on and do it. CRM. So, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so you got to use all your available resources. Yeah. She works from home and has a computer on a lot of days. So, um, so I don't know how it is everywhere else, so it's hard for me to speak to that. Um, but but the well, we had we just have a comment that just popped in from a United pilot, um, uh, and it sounds like oh, you can just read it yourself. It says it's uh, not as flexible, I would say, and and I think and you mentioned that James, like probably Southwest has the reputation right now for being the most flexible. Uh, yeah, and it goes it goes to what Max said when you have one fleet type with everyone training yep. on the exact same airplane, the 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 reason, so scheduling and pay are the two biggest questions that pilots have. How does it work? Yep. And the difficulty with it is there is so much nuance to scheduling and there is so much nuance to, to pay um, that the way that we do it is when folks come in the door, we either use some networking um, 
training that we give in terms of meeting people if they don't already know people there, or we go through and we map out specific questions to ask. So you can go to someone that works at that specific carrier and say, hey, look, if I was going to be based here, if I was going to be flying to this airplane, how would I how would I adjust the schedule or flex the schedule to make to meet my needs? When you go about it from that perspective, you end up being able to figure out, hey, look, what companies are going to work for you and what companies are not. Uh, everybody's wife is chiming in right now. <laughs> yeah. this is not for you guys <laughs> come on uh, Kid, we, we should see as if Take she's willing to, to you know uh subcontract her skills and start a little mentoring group for yeah, uh, no, new no, hires. No, no. no we're good we're good uh, we'll do it live. all right no. we'll do it live <laughs> and they, they think she do it live for- I can, i'll write it and we'll do it live uh the other thing that i want to mention too is that the and I don't, again, know how it is everywhere else, but at Southwest, you do have the opportunity to work a lot more if you want to and scale your income and, or you can just work less and you can actually trade for trips with less value. And 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 so the flexibility too, not just on the days you want to work and the trips you want to fly, but also uh, how hard you want to work and which therefore equals how much money you want to make is, is another uh, option because there's people of the same seniority that have very different income levels based on how much they want, how motivated. Yeah, but think about it this way, Max. What's the minimum amount of what's the max amount of flying you can drop every month? Oh, well, honestly, right now to just drop it is like, yeah, yeah not not much, but you can, you can, if you're sly about it, you can turn three days into two days into one days. Mm-hmm. And so you can drop here and there, but you can't just like you know, clear it all off. I don't feel like working this month. But That's contractually reality. speaking, if there was someone that wanted to take it from you, you could no. do that, yeah, correct? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Not every carrier yeah. allows that. And you know, so sorry. there's, yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's nuance in there in terms of, hey, look, what what type of flexibility are you looking for? Is it like you were saying, Max, you're trying to turn three days into two days? Are you trying to do three days versus four days? Are you trying to block your time together so you can go out and fly 10, 12 days straight and then have the rest of the month off? Are you looking to fly mostly nights, mostly days? Yeah. The scheduling stuff is so unique to each person. The most effective way to do it is to grab somebody at the company and start talking with them and they'll physically show you their schedule and they'll show you, here's how I would actually get what you want. And here's how long it would take to get what you want. Um, yeah. And once you do that, you can see pretty quick, hey, look, the level it's, it's, is the level of flexibility the contract offers right for me? Not is it as flexible or whatever somebody else might need. Well, so- I, think, I, I think to put a bow on it, one of another big thing is your flexibility and your ability to trade and drop and do all that is going to be um, living in base is important. Are you living in a base, one of the biggest bases on your fleet type? I think that's also huge too. Are you at a super small base with only a few lines? You know, um, I, I've always said like, if you want to have the best quality of life, you would go like lit, just commit to living in Atlanta. And working for Delta or living in Dallas or maybe Phoenix for Southwest, but being in a base with a huge um, fleet is always going to give you more options to trade. Let's take a quick break from the live broadcast. Uh, You heard in the show a few times, Timothy P. Pope uh, get mentioned. He was in the uh, comments. He was participating live during the whole show. And you want to know why? It's because he was with his people. He is a certified financial planner helping professional pilots around the globe how to figure out how to make big financial choices. We talked about, should I stay and make a ton of money at a regional airline? Should I go to a major? Should, should I do this? Should I do that? Tim is the, the guy that you talk to to figure out your financial moves. You can get on his calendar for a free consultation. Check out the link in the show notes and get hooked up. Stick to what you know best pros handle the money from retirement planning to an investment management to military transition and tax planning tim is your financial planning partner he helps professional pilots make the most out of life all right back to the live show all right uh next one i am currently at southwest as a captain in the training department been here for a couple of years more than average due to our new rates. I'm making a bit over 40K a month. Now I just got an offer from my dream airline, Southwest, and have even thought, uh, and even though this is my dream job, not sure if I should leave. Right now I am home every night, have all the holidays and days off I want, and making too much money, and money I don't think I'll be able to make at Southwest. What do you recommend? 
That's exactly why the regionals have done what they've done. <laughs> um, <laughs> look, you, you're talking about making $500,000 a year and going back to 90 to go work at the carrier that you want to. Um, the, the big variable that pops up with this, especially with the regionals, is, look, we all know airline contracts are for a period of time, right? Four years, five years, six years, you know, depending on when they, when they sign their contracts, right? Um, but the, and Tim Pope does bring actually a really good example. So I'm going to try to come in here because he's the guy that we actually send folks to when it comes to the, the financial planning aspect of this. Um, but it is, this is a short-term versus a long-term game, right? So the question is, how long do you think the regional airlines are going to pay pilots $500,000 a year to fly regional jets, right? I mean, that is a, a very difficult model to maintain long-term profitably. Uh, if anything goes wrong in the economy, right? The easiest ones to pull that stuff back from are the regionals. I'm not saying you can't pull it away from a legacy pilot, but it is much more difficult to. And so taking a look at how old are you? What are your financial goals? Um, what, um, what are your actual career goals? Like, do you care if you ever fly? Back to that original question of wide body aircraft or not, is really what's going to drive that. Now, Tim brings up a really good point about going through with a financial planner, specifically somebody that's familiar with the aviation industry and contracts, right? And having them walk through, what would this look like financially if I stayed? What would it look like if I left? And you can throw in different assumptions into there and and try and get an idea on what would the financial cost of this be? It is very difficult, though, to give up the money and give up the quality of life for the prestige in the short term. It becomes easier when you look at it from a long term play. Yeah. I, how long can you make 40K a month at, at SkyWest? I just. What, but what if you said, I'm going to make 40K a month at SkyWest until they stop paying me and then I'll jump over and I don't care how much seniority I've lost? I understand there's a lot of people that may say, hey, that's a horrible idea, but it depends on what your financial goals are. Yeah. It depends on do you have a pension from someplace else? Do you not? Do you have a business? Do you not? It's it's not as much of a one size fits all as, as people think. Um, and it becomes a lot harder to take that pay cut the older you get. I think what, what pilots oftentimes don't realize is you you can actually quantify these things on paper with spreadsheets, with people that know. And, and it's not, I think a lot of people, when it comes to the money and the, and the long-term, they're kind of taking a swag at it and saying, you know, well, this seems like it fits about right, but, but you really can quantify these things quite accurately. Um, if you talk to the right people. So, um, we would always recommend that. Yeah. hundred percent. All right. More, more, more comments coming in here. Um, Aaron wants to know any insight on Delta's reserve and bidding like y'all were mentioning for Southwest and United. No. Next question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, but let's actually put that back up here for a second. Um, so when we see questions like this, right, it seems like a really, really, really direct question. But once again, it goes back to what base, what aircraft type, and what do you want your, your, your quality of life to look like? So a lot of these questions seem deceptively simple, but that's why when we work with folks on this, we put them in contact with people directly so they can actually map out and show them, here is exactly how you would get what you wanna get. In general though, when you take a look at the legacy carriers, Delta has amazing work rules comparatively speaking, right? It's, a, it's different when you bring Southwest into that mix um, but when you take a look at Delta's work rules, especially in their new contract, they're, they're really impressive. They really are. And that's the other thing. You brought up a good point with their new contract. You have to realize all of these rules could change because <laughs> almost all the big airlines are in contract negotiations. Yeah, but, but one of the things that – because you bring up a good point about how contracts can change. That is correct, but this is where um, pairing up with folks that have long – history in the business matters, right? This is this is where kind of our strength comes in. Because if you know, if you have access to resources that can talk about what contract negotiations have looked like over the years, uh, we were joking around with this last night when, uh, when we were talking about some of the previous episodes we did together, right? But if everyone goes back to the coronavirus, right? Remembers when, <laughs> when, when we were doing our 205 episodes, 
we I had guys on on our team talking to union folks that were at U.S. Airways and American in the 80s doing contract negotiations so we could get an idea on, hey, how were the airlines going to react? What were they going to do? So on and so forth. You can each carrier has its own culture and you can see the things that pilots fight for and really don't want to give up and things they are willing to give up. And so, yes, contracts do change. But it really does help to get in touch with the right people so you understand the culture and the history of the company in terms of like, hey, look, what are the things that pilots are going to go run to the hill on with flaming swords and fight for? And what are the things where when they go to take it away, they're going to go, eh, it was good while it lasted. Yeah. But it every, have pilot, it every pilot group has those things that yeah. they that yeah. are non-negotiable that people. Exactly. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and, and you know what, James, it reminds me of during those coronavirus um, episodes, what did you teach people? It's how to network online, right? Especially mm -hmm. in LinkedIn. And yep. so for folks that are listening right now, they're probably going, well, I don't know anyone at Delta maybe. Um, and, and LinkedIn, which we're broadcasting on right now, is one of those great tools. Um, and you guys have specific training on how to actually make those connections and start to be able to have those conversations. We get on and screen share the LinkedIn profile and write the messages with them, right? And we show them how to write messages that are not canned, that are genuine, that you can use repeatedly to get a conversation started because that's the hardest part. The hardest part is the approach. It's how do you get the conversation started? Once someone's in a conversation, they can carry it on their own, no problem, right? Yeah. It's the getting the conversation started. Yeah, we'll sit down with you one-on-one. -on -one. We'll actually help you write the messages. And they work and yeah. like really well. It's like having a good pickup line at the bar. Just got to get right. the exactly. conversation started. That's right. If you were a booger, I'd pick you first. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> and that's how James got his wife. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Lucky, lucky gal she is. Right, Eileen? Uh, <laughs> I can't wait for her comment next. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm about uh, to get okay. eviscerated. I think I, have, I think I have to go. <laughs> yeah, that's right. This is it. Last last live appearance for James. It was yeah, great exactly. Last, One and yeah. only. Um, okay. Um, Mock Jesus uh, writes in and he says, uh, can you provide any general insight as to how checkride failures may impact career progression? Scenario is a CFI with a, a thousand hours, restricted ATP and three failures. Goal is 121 flying. I come on and do a live with you and now I'm getting rejected by my own wife live. Thanks guys. <laughs> <laughs> it's progressing well. <laughs> um, okay. So checkride failures. So um the reality is there is um, almost nothing you can have in your background that we haven't seen. Uh, and I won't go into specifics just because we signed, we at Raven signed confidentiality agreements with all the clients that we work with. Um, it's one of the ways that we guarantee their comfortability in terms of sharing information with us that they know, hey, look, it's not going to be, it's not going to, I'm not, we're not going to take their information and share it publicly. Okay. So that that's the first thing. So we signed confidentiality agreements. So I could talk in generalities but I can't talk like, hey, this specific person. Um, DUIs, criminal convictions, terminations, dishonorable discharges, other than honorable discharges, check ride failures, multiple check ride failures, right? And the list goes on and on and on of things, of, of clients that we've worked with that have that that are at legacy carriers. So the bottom line up front is it is not going to, to limit you in the slightest. Now, when we talk about check ride failures, there are a couple of things to be aware of. So the first is recency does matter with certain carriers. Um, there are uh, kind of the unofficial term is like a second chance carrier. There are certain carriers that are second chance carriers. Basically, hey, you trip and fall, get right back up. Hey, look, man, we're going to give you the shot right now. There are other carriers that are a little bit more conservative, meaning they want to see a year or 24 months between the check ride failure. That is... Uh, Individual to each carrier, I, I won't go in and list every one of them, but we know which ones are going to give you the chance, which ones are going to want. That's for our premium stuff, subscribers. But... If you want to uh, get that list, we'll be happy to sell that to you. Well, yeah, it'd be the next hour and a half of me talking about what yeah. each of the individual carriers do hiring wise to go into that. So, OK, so so that's that's first. Um, the the second component of it is we're, they're looking at trend. Right. So did you fail your private, your instrument commercial and your CFI? Right. Did you fail none of your primary training and fail three type ratings, right? Like they're looking for what is the trend? What is the connecting piece here? The CFI has such a high failure rate that it is, um, I'm going to be careful on how I say this, because if it's handled in incorrectly, it, it is a deal breaker. It can be a deal breaker. 
But for the most part, you'll watch most of the recruiters go, oh, you failed your CFI? Yeah, okay, whatever. They don't even ask any questions about it, right? As long as it's written up properly and you're prepared to talk about it in 60 seconds or less, it's 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 not, it's kind of a nothing burger, if that makes sense. Um, the big problem that folks are running into is number one, they're not putting it on the application. They're, they're getting creative with how they're reading the application. Um, and it's difficult because uh, each individual carrier, especially now that um, the carriers have been kind of spearheading, creating their own applications. Everyone saw probably American opened up their own now new internal application here last week. United has theirs. Um, FedEx has it, right? The carriers are kind of going to their own individual applications. Each carrier asks check right failure questions differently. So you can have you can have one CFI check ride failure, and some carriers are going to want to see it. Some carriers are not going to want to see it. So it gets confusing with folks. Should I be disclosing it? Should I not be disclosing it? The next is when they get into the interview, um, is the it's shame and embarrassment typically, and they don't want to talk about it. And what happens is when we get ashamed, when we get embarrassed, the body language that we give off, uh, talking in generalities, talking in circles, giving really large amounts yeah a lot it, yeah exactly not making eye contact a large amount of background story without me actually understanding what's going on it's the same way it looks when someone's lying it just looks deceptive I'm not saying that people are lying i'm saying it looks the same to the recruiter right and so what happens is they show up to the interview with a shovel and they just dig instead of using a very simple format where you give them a bottom line up front and then you give them the context and you hit them with exactly what they need. So you build trust and rapport with your answer in the first 30 seconds and then you can kind of run with it. And what happens when you do that is the emphasis shifts from being on the failure to the, what did you learn from it? How did it change how you do things today? And that's really where I want the conversation going, right? So. If you got arrested for stealing socks from a Walmart when you were in college, right? That in itself is not a deal breaker. Lying about it on an application, lying about it in an interview, or not being able to talk about it confidently, those are deal breakers. Well, and we've also talked thing. about with you, with other people, about about how you bring that subject to light in the interview. And if and if you do it right, then you kind of control the narrative. Um, versus sheepishly answering whatever questions are asked of you, right? You do. And and depending, <clears throat> so when somebody has an issue in their background, the first thing we do is we actually book out a session with them and we pull all the paperwork and we go through it um, to make sure we, we factually understand what happened. Uh, you'd be surprised how many times the paperwork does not necessarily m match exactly what happened. Um, I remember... Uh, a, <laughs> One of my guys reached out and he goes, he's trying to write the explanation for why a guy failed this check ride. And I, I said, well, what did the guy fail for? And he goes, uh, everything. I go, you, you can't fail for everything. That's not actually how it works. Like there's a PTS and now it's an ACS, but there's task items. There's, there's what task items did he fail? Comes back and he goes, guy said he failed for everything. I go, okay, you can't do that. Get a copy of the uh, notice of disapproval and send it to me freaking examiner wrote failed everything on the actual <laughs> thing right like you see dumb things where you're like okay the paperwork's not going to match what you're going to say in the interview because you can't how do you show up to the interview you go, what'd you fail for everything so you have to <laughs> dispute that uh yeah. yeah so so the first is we start with the paperwork um we help folks run background checks we help them pull paperwork there's a lot of different tricks we can do kind of behind the scenes to make sure you get those records there's a lot of times where people can't get records because they don't exist anymore um so we can kind of piece things together Okay. Once you have that, you've got to do the write-up in a very specific way so that when the recruiter is reading it, because remember, when you show up to the interview, they grab all your stuff before they pull you into the interview and they're reviewing it. They're reviewing the application, your logbooks, reviewing all that, right? You can write it up in a certain way so that when you walk into the room, the recruiter already knows what happened. We physically write it for you. We don't have you write it, send it to us, and we proofread it. We write it for you. We send it to you. You proofread it, say, hey, it's accurate. We then have a background process where it goes through two other pilots that read it before it gets posted onto your application. And then we actually tell you specifically what questions to post that onto. 
Once mm. that's done, now it comes a matter of, okay, we know what they're going to see when they walk into the interview. They're going to see this before you even start talking. So now you're walking into the interview from a position of power as opposed to on your heels going, shoot, when's this going to when's, when's this going to come up? Yeah. Yeah. Then we talk about the four different places that that back, background issue can pop up in an interview, right? And now we start talking about, you know, um, what areas do you have control of when it pops up? What areas do they have control of when it pops up? And how do you leverage those opportunities? Um, sometimes the recruiters will throw you a softball, tell me about a time question, so that you can talk about that issue in a very comfortable way. You need to be looking for them. We had a guy missed one. And um, he was so nervous. He, he, he went into the interview and the recruiter asked him to tell me about a time question. And he gave a, you know, customer service one. The guy goes, I think you probably got a better one. How about that failure over there? Right. Guy threw him a softball. So when they threw you the softball, hit it, right. Take advantage of that. So you need to know, we don't want any surprises in the interview. You need to know where that stuff is going to pop up, how it's going to pop up, what all the resources are the recruiters have to bring those up. And then how do you, talk about that in a comfortable and confident way. It's also the reason that why when we do interview prep with people, we video record everything so they can watch themselves back and fit like we're pointing out the body language so they can watch back and go, oh, yeah, that's where it is. And then we have them take their phone and they record it over and over and over and over and over again. And then they listen to it back. And then we come and we practice it again and again and again. And we have two or three people observe them doing it. So they're getting multiple pieces of feedback. There's a, there's a process to it so that by the time, remember when you did your first V1 cut and your engine, your hands were shaking after that engine failure. And after about the 10th one, you're like, Oh, I just got to do these three things and it's fine. It's the same way it works for the interview prep. You can, okay. you can talk about it so many times that when you walk in, it's not, doesn't cause anxiety. That was good stuff. We're taking a quick break from live flight advice to thank our sponsor, Harvey Watt, the world's largest provider of loss of license insurance. If you're a professional pilot and you depend on that income to support your family, make sure you're covered in case you lose that ticket. RVWatt.com. They have coverage, life insurance, everything you need to keep your income stream secure. We've got a couple more we got to get to before we get to the rapid fire session here. Uh, Nick's asking us, a lot of my older mentors are bragging about the airlines because of the money. Do you think that corporate will eventually keep up with pay or do I have to sacrifice pay for quality of life? Well, that's the million dollar question right oh, there. Oh, yeah. Here's the <laughs> yeah. answer. It's very quick. Just get your pen, Nick. Here it is. Just go to Sun Country. That's it. All yeah. right, next question. <laughs> next question. Move on. So... There are 100% corporate operators that are keeping up with the pay. And I can't go into specifics once again, but I do the salary negotiation with folks. I come up with a strategy and I get the feedback afterwards when they're done negotiating. There are some insane deals out there right now in corporate aviation, but they're quiet. When people are getting, it's not like when Delta has a brand new contract and they post publicly, hey, look, you know, look at our brand new contract and how amazing it is. In the corporate world, when folks are getting those types of contracts, they're keeping quiet about it. Yeah. Um, well, and there, and there's exceptions to every rule, right? And of course, there are some people that own airplanes that can pay whatever they feel like paying somebody, and it really doesn't affect can. anything. There are others that it, that 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 is not the most, and most that's not the case. But I think if you look at overall in the whole grand scheme of things, it's it's still going to be very difficult for corporate, on average, to keep up with where the airlines are at, just because of the economics of the those two operations and wh how big those costs are spread am amongst, um, you know, if you look at it, the size of the airplane, how many people in the back and how much revenue it generates versus, you know, it, and, and you look at it, one of the things I've always said too, is that with the pilot salaries going up like this, um, it, this, the salaries start to become a majority of the aircraft operation, you know, it starts to eat such a big part of the budget. There's only so much that, <laughs> Of, the, of a total operational budget of an airplane um, that can be eaten up by pilot salaries. It's just. It, it's going to be doing. really hard for a guy flying an S a citation S two to make $500,000 a year. <laughs> right. Yeah. But you know, it's, you know what though, 
what I did for a long time though, is because a lot of times in, in corporate flying, you do find yourself with a lot of time on your hands, a lot of extra time. And if you're productive with that time, you can certainly, you know, close that gap. Uh, I sold real estate for a long time and I sold and I hustled hard when I was not flying airplanes, selling houses. And, uh, there were years I made more money than doing that, than flying the airplane I was flying. And, and that certainly, you know, but, but again, that that's a quality of life. You mentioned in your question about quality of life, that that's a, that shifts your quality of life certainly. And, and, you know, there's a reason I don't do that anymore. So that's right. It's a lot easier to show up. I, I, I mean, I, I think, in general, I think the rule of thumb is, yeah, you're probably going to make money, more money at the airlines. You know, Chris in the comments points out just the huge retirement contribution that you're going to get from most airlines. And he's not wrong. And there are, are there has to be other factors. I think, you know, Max, you have a really good saying, you know, what is the prime? What is your prime asset? Is it time or yeah. is it money? Is it health? Is it relationships? You know, those are all very important things. And for every person, that balance is going to be different. And so, you know, what's what I think is really hard in the pilot journey, especially when you're starting out, is that you cannot conceptualize the, what your the job will, how it will affect your personal life later on when you're married, when you have kids, when there are things at home that you need to be at. And that is really hard, when, at least for me, was really hard to to realize what was going to be important later in life. And then again, that may change again because, you know, my kids will be gone at some point and, um, and then I, I might want to do something different. So it's, I think it's really hard to quantify one specific thing for one part in time. If that makes sense. Well, and the other thing too, with business aviation, that that's always been difficult is that you never know what to count on. Like yeah. long term. it's, it's a, a lot of times corporate jobs, like we've said, is a, is a job versus a career and it's in yeah. at the airlines, which is, you know, you don't ever know anything long term, um, but you can certainly have a better idea, I think, over the course of a career, kind of what you're looking at at the airlines versus uh, corporate. So which which certainly affects all things, money, yeah. time, retirement, you know, all the things we mentioned. Here's a perfect example from my son. Uh, posted via my wife. He goes, I don't like it when you go to training. It would be cool if you didn't miss my birthday this year. <laughs> I go to training every single year over his birthday, just the way it works. And so those are the things that you would never think about when you're 25, right? You would you would be um, you would be thinking about oh, I want to fly to cool destinations or you know, I need to make the most money, whatever it is, and you're not thinking about your kids' birthdays and that kind of stuff. So Lots to think about. Um, Look at Rob right here. He says, keep your 90-year-old self happy with whatever decision. Put it this way. Very few people at the end of their life have ever looked back and be like, God, I wish I would have just made more money. Yeah. That's very, very few people say that. That's actually like a statistic because I was listening to this podcast I mentioned before about a guy that writes books about this stuff. But um, but yeah, most people's regret at the end of their days is time-related, not spending enough time with family or not doing more not traveling enough you know things like that so so the younger people are forced to make these long-term decisions about their 40-year career at the airlines um i think that that decision is more challenging because you just don't have as much reference to to draw from but yeah here's here's the conflict right um everybody knows money doesn't make you happy but everyone wants the opportunity to prove that uh prove that true <laughs> right that's so true very true it's always easy to say but uh yeah that it's it, look for most people it is hard to stare and look i i i'm someone that does it uh, at least on the flying side of the house i talk about it all the time i give up about three hundred thousand dollars a year for my quality of life on my flying income and i'm comfortable with that i i don't ever wake up and have any resentment i don't have any regret i don't ever look at any of the clients that we get hired and go man you know i'm really you know i i i'm really ticked off that they're getting this amazing thing and I'm not, I'm, I'm clear with myself that that's what I want for a lot of people. They've got to go try it to find out if they want it or not. Right. Well, You'd be surprised how many people are going to, um, to airlines and then leaving either to a different airline or like, they I mean, they're getting hired at a legacy airline, going to a different legacy. They're getting hired at a legacy, going back to corporate because until they get there, they don't, you don't actually know. 
the, the what, we've, what we've tried to explain before is that uh, it's it's easy to realize how much uh, you know not being able to have your own airplane really means until you've had your own airplane or that boat or whatever you want. Mm-hmm. But the real thing about wealth and, and where it really crosses the boundaries when you don't have to stress about it. Like when you go to the gas yeah. station and you fill up your gas tank and you drive away and you're like, I wonder how much that was. Like you didn't even look because it, cause you just, or you go to the grocery store, you don't, you, you just buy stuff at Costco and you don't really think about what it's going to cost. Cause it's food. It's, you know, like but, an Iberian ham. Yeah. <laughs> As I told my wife, this is not a want. It is a need. Max was carving but, a, a dried ham in his living room for a month during COVID. <laughs> that's beard a different and story. <laughs> yeah. All right. Anyway. But, uh, but anyway, yeah, it's, it, you're going to reach that level of wealth flying airplanes at some point where you don't have to worry about, uh, you know, how much gas you put in your truck or, or whatever. Um, the rest of the stuff, it's, it's a diminishing return at the end of the day. So yeah, easy to right. say, hard to, Grass. It is. And and I'll tell you what. <laughs> she says it was oops, sorry. <laughs> the ham was delicious though. I will. I, I'm right? <laughs> What's crazy? Here's but I'll tell you what. Here is an experience that I had. James, you had it. Max, you had it too. Young in our, young in our career, we had the opportunity to fly at regional airlines with old pilots that had been in the game for a long time and you do get to look at people in and you're like i don't know if the vast majority of these guys that i fly with if that's who i want to be when i'm in my 60s i um i flew at american eagle where there was a lot of older captains there um you might not have that same experience at colgan james but i think that there is an eye-opening of 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 that oh is this my path the cool thing for me was getting to actually fly with guys that were on the union committee during the Eastern strike, the guys that were in management at New York air, the guy, like you, you get to fly with these people that live through the ups and the downs of the industry. Right. And you start to hear, Hey, what does that look like? And it helps you start to figure out for yourself what actually really matters yeah. right now. Everything's skyrocketing. And so it's really hard to, 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 to be level-headed and not go, dude, I want to get on that, that rocket ship, right? But ultimately, when you get there, right, you get hired by that legacy or wherever it is you want to work, and now you're six months in, you're a year in, you're two years in, and the, the novelty wears off, that's when you really find out, hey, did I actually really want to do this or not? And the money doesn't fix that. The dog never thought he was going to catch the bus, right, James? Precisely correct. <laughs> what do you do when you catch the bus? Exactly. Like maybe I'll put nicer rims on it. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, all right. Should we put in a last call for any more questions? We've uh, we've got a couple more that we're going to hit. Um, but if anyone in that's uh, tuning in live. No, it's too in, late. Let's go to the rapid fire. Should we go rapid fire here? Okay. If you've got a burning going. question, get it in quick. Uh, we're going to go rapid fire. This is lightning round. These are short answers. Um, here's the first one. Oh, this is a fun one. What's the funniest ATC communication you've ever heard during flight? Yo, oh, that's not fair, man. I've eviscerated some controllers. <laughs> yeah, because you, you don't have to worry about consequences. It's precisely correct. <laughs> it's, and I'm going to leave it at that. <laughs> it's mostly it's mostly the interactions with Volaris at uh, yeah. either O'Hare or in uh, New York. My favorite, Volaris, one of my favorites. Hello, Vol- yeah, the, exactly. What of the what of the South American carriers? I was in LAX and he completely blew a crossing restriction and the controller goes, Hey, Valaris, are you going to make a two zero zero at, you know, at the, at the fix? And the guy comes back and he goes, sometimes we make it. Sometimes we don't. <laughs> <laughs> I remember you telling that story. <laughs> so yeah, there's so many good ones. Um, the other funny one I heard this one time, uh, also out of LAX and the turboprop, a lot of Alaska airlines flying around. And uh, guy was lost and um, taxiing around the airport. And finally, the guy goes, see the uh, the white airplane with the picture of my mother-in-law on the tail? Follow him. <laughs> <laughs> that's Alaska. Yeah. <laughs> so, that's uh, so good. Um, okay. Next rapid fire question. Um, got a few of these with the similar theme. Need low time pilot job ideas because I want to skip flight instructing. Yeah, so there's a couple of operators. I'll give some folks some names. Um, 
that that hire folks sub 1000 how far below a thousand is going to vary um typically speaking that like 500 to 800 hours makes you more competitive for these um but start taking a look at contour cutter grandview uh, jsx silver cape air trade win plain sense castle if you want to fly a sop 340 that i used to fly yeah uh, and then mountaineer cargo um wow. are a couple of different operators that folks can take a look at that oh, was a just tapestry of low time off. jobs you just well there. Dude, we we have a lot of clients that don't want to flight instruct and we work with them through both the networking and the interview prep side to help them get those jobs because the other component to this that folks don't realize is the biggest things that people struggle with in that first job that's not flight instructing is instrument skills um they that was skydiving bro what if you drop yeah skydivers, exactly pipeline patrol uh fish counting what else yeah but most most pilots have they've really honestly done the same six instrument approaches that are within 20 miles of their local airport right they haven't done arrivals they haven't done departures they haven't done climate descent via they haven't had to meet speed restrictions um they haven't had to to do any of that stuff um and so now you go into a contour or a jsx or something like that and things are moving at five miles a minute and their instrument skills aren't there so you really once you get that kind of get that commercial you really want to spend that next 250 hours really beefing up your instrument skills reading different types of approach plates departure and arrival procedures so on and so forth so we work with them to make sure they're prepared because the last thing we want to do is help someone get a job at a place that they're going to fail out of training right it's when you get that first job at 500 or 750 hours that you're going to go fly a jet or a turboprop you want to be ready for it so yeah. just keep that in okay. mind yeah and chris, chris brings up a good comment a comment he says why skip flight instruction it's a great way to learn uh what you don't what you know and what you don't know and i mean look if you can flight instruct do it it's gonna suck it's not gonna be fun but it's gonna make you a way better pilot i promise you it's yeah, gonna we make you a better all, pilot we were all so very surprised yeah. at the end of flight instructing i think most people that have done it were very surprised at how much they learned yes even though you're teaching all the stuff you just learned it doesn't I was like you would, right? I was shocked at how useful those lazy eights were in the real world. It's incredible, right? <laughs> Listen, yeah. I just did eights on pylons the other day. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, awesome. Okay. Thank you. Next lightning question: Where do you all see the regional airline model in the next decade? <laughs> well, just really quickly, just one <laughs> sentence, James. If you could Jeez. just quickly summarize that. Yeah, if you could just yeah. sum that up real quick. Yeah, quick. Uh, the the regional airline model will not look the same 24 months from now than it does today i mean it, it you can already see it with what they're doing with skywest charter i mean it just paying folks forty thousand dollars a month to to be like it's just not sustainable i don't yeah. know what it's going to look like but it's going to have to transform um whether that means they're going to cut service, they're going to upgauge the airplanes, they're going to bring regionals onto legacy airline seniority lists. I don't know how they're going to do it, right? But the the way the model looks right now is not the way it's going to look in twenty four to thirty six months from now. Hundred percent agree. And unless the model, unless the plan of the model is to keep parking airplanes and not fly them because you don't have enough pilots. <laughs> right. You never know. Yeah. Um, okay. This is an interesting one. No job right now. Waiting on a class date at AA in July. What should I do until then? Start reading some books, man. Go out and fish. I mean, if, yeah, if you got the class something. date, you don't have a job. And well, because but in, enjoy the downtime. Yeah, put it put it this way. The next time you might find yourself in the situation, it's not gonna be with it's not gonna be so rosy because it would be yeah. a result of a furlough or something. <laughs> yeah. So so use the time to do something that's not 100 percent true he could have a huge gap waiting on ioe he could luck out a second time <laughs> well there could be another covid with yeah. those, those extended yeah. time off yeah. programs where they paid you not to show up anymore. Yeah. that was those were a pretty good deal too so never say never i suppose okay we got a good one to close out the show this is oh brian wants best crash pad stories dude the best ones we can't <laughs> talk about yeah we'll it's... just say that Guys dressing up in pilot uniforms and going down to the local hotel with a bag in their hand so they can eat free <laughs> breakfast that they couldn't afford when regional air, airline pilots weren't paid anything. Brian was my old roommate, and we used to live right <laughs> below a crash pad. So we had some, you know the stories. You were in them. <laughs> That's why he's asking for you to tell them. He wants yeah, to take exactly. The yeah, right. Exactly. Um, okay. This one's very serious, guys. We have an airman with a broken heart. 
he wrote in, he said, I had a long, I'm not making this up. I had a long-term girlfriend who just broke up with me for an F-22 demo pilot because he inspires her and I'm just a charter pilot. I get it. Fighter pilots are dope, but damn. <laughs> he yeah. works for a fractional and can move anywhere. God, they think he wants to get out of town. <laughs> what should our young heartbroken pilot do? He has the consider ability to live him, anywhere. He works for fractional. Consider himself lucky. Yeah. Where's yeah, that's figure? true. He dodged a bullet there. Yeah. Could have given up 50% of your net worth if it wasn't just dating. That's true. <laughs> yeah. That's <a> good point. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I mean, you got to go go somewhere where the where the odds are in your favor. Listen, here's what yeah. I would say. Go to Charleston, South Carolina. That's my advice. The, Call the, the fractional the, and ask if you can become part of their demo team. I, mean, I don't know. San yeah. Diego's not bad. <laughs> Yeah, San Diego could work. Go. I mean, yeah, we're biased, but Phoenix is pretty good. <laughs> Phoenix is good. I think I, I don't think you can go wrong. Listen, my wife went to school in Charleston, South Carolina. It's the exact opposite of Embry Riddle. There's like eleven <laughs> girls for every guy, and it's, I'm not even making that up. It's unbelievable. Yeah, so yeah, that's my advice. And I'm pretty sure that's a that's a domicile city in uh, on the NetJets list. So. You know what they say, Dylan. The best way to get over a girl is, right? <laughs> bid for a new city at the next preferential bid window. <laughs> yeah. oh, I guess that works, too. Uh, yeah, that's right. Uh, all right, Chris Chris is closing us out with the best advice of all. <laughs> he says, don't do flight to legacies. Get on and make more than an F-22 pilot will in his entire career. That's a win. All right, there you go. I guess the, it's just... Chris might... Uh, we we Chris, might need you to reach the... out to Chris. Chris might be uh, be welcomed on as the newest member of the Diamond Dogs here pretty soon. He's very yeah, engaged. Exactly. I like this. Chris, shoot us an email. We're gonna have to send you some swag for uh, for your uh, competition. Here it is. Chris is probably Chat GPT that uh, Joel's working behind the scenes. <laughs> <laughs> it's my wife created an alter ego that she's feeding Chat GPT. <laughs> Stole our premium login. I love it. Well, this was a lot of fun. This was our first live broadcast. We really appreciate everyone that took the time to join us and participate. Love all the comments. We still have tons of flight advice we didn't even get to, so we're going to have to do this again. Of course, you can always get a hold of James O'Neill by visiting ravencareers.com and uh, clicking on the contact button. I think they can just jump right onto your calendar there, right, James? Yep, they can contact us to get right on my calendar. Yeah. Awesome. All right, 100. We did it. We are in the books. And we did it live. Thank you. We did Thank it live. Bill O'Reilly, O'Reilly for the inspiration of yelling the word live. <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> There's nothing I love more than celebrities getting caught being idiots. That's one of my... <laughs> Thank you to Joel for figuring out how to get that into the video clip somehow. I couldn't believe you when, I, when you showed us that in the thing. That was incredible. This is another one of those times. It's like something we think so funny. And I wonder if other people like yeah. just like, what is that? what's so funny about Probably that? Probably not. But I think most people think it's funny. I don't know. Whatever. What do we care? Probably not. We think it's hilarious. Thanks to all of the folks who have participated in the last hundred episodes, written us emails and reviews contributed in some way been a guest on the show um also a special shout out to uh my dad who really helped us uh, actually come up with the first design of the logo um he and uh, with a lot of the audio uh engineering stuff in the beginning he used to own a recording studio so he helped us out get the audio going and of course some of you may have met him as the uh, 215 apostle in the airline or <laughs> terminal with our business cards, handing them out to every single pilot he sees. And here's the weird thing. He was just visiting a couple of weeks ago. He said, he's still never run into a pilot that's heard of our show. He hands our business Ouch. cards out to everybody. And no one has ever been like, Oh yeah, I know that show. Listen, so we're still not that big. What do you want? <laughs> so here's what he wants to do. He's I'm printing him up some, uh, some special stuff. So that he's going to carry around. The, he, this was his idea. It's the first person that actually that he talks to that has heard of our show. He's going to give him a special piece of unique twenty one five swag yeah. as an award. How about that? <laughs> yeah. So keep an eye out for Tom out in the audience. Thanks for all your help, Dad. Thanks to everyone. If you want to get in touch with us, it's info at twenty one five podcast dot com. Do you think you know anybody that's listened to all hundred episodes? Mm. I mean, I can't. I haven't listened to all hundred. No. You think your dad has? Me. Well, I, I guess, I don't know. You think your Maybe. dad has? No, I don't even know. He hated the Roger Reeves ones. I know. That was so funny.
so funny. <laughs> Uh, all right. Well, uh, I'm, let's uh, Joel. Let's go ahead and have Sting play us out on our live uh, to end our live uh, episode here. <laughs> That's right. Okay. Uh, for the first hundred, thank you so much, and let's remember for the next hundred, flexibility is the key to air power. Hopefully, we'll see you at two hundred. See everybody. <laughs> The statements made in this show are our own opinions and do not reflect, nor were they under any direction from any of our employers.